Well, thanks everybody for uh, for joining me this morning. Um, so my name is Alex Fredrickson. I'm one of the account executives here at Encore. Um, for those of you that are already CRM users, you, you may have worked with me in the past. Uh, for those of you who are not, uh, really excited to have you here and uh, teach you a little bit about automation in Dynamics 365. Uh, and so one of the reasons we wanted to present this topic in particular was because we work with a lot of our CRM customers and and they have a lot of opportunity to, to really shortcut steps and, and to automate processes, whether it's in sales or, or in their project organizations. Um, a lot of the times with, uh, with customer service, there's a lot of opportunity there as well. And we, we just feel like people aren't always aware of the tools that are available to them in Dynamics. Um, and there's some really powerful stuff. And, and so that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, we're going to stretch a, a tiny bit past the scope of, of Dynamics 365 specifically, uh, talk about a little bit of Power BI and, and other ways you can um, save some time by automating reporting. But, but our focus is really going to be in the CRM system, um, talking about some scenarios that we think would be valuable to you or, or that you can twist uh, to make fit for your organization. Uh, and really the focus today is what can you do to empower your own staff or your own organization through these automation steps. So I'm not going to get too crazy into, you know, writing JavaScript plugins or anything like that. We're going to keep it um, really to our, our workflows, our, our actions, and our business rules to try and give you some of the knowledge that you're going to need to implement these things yourselves. Alrighty, so our focus today is going to be all around the, the tools of the trade. So what's available to you with automation and dynamics um, and why you should be using it. Uh, and so with that, we're going to be covering, you know, some scenarios that that fits into. So just trying to plant the seed, um, some different ideas of how you could actually apply these tools uh, and how you might go about starting to set those automations up. We're also going to do a couple different live demos, so I'm going to be bouncing uh, back and forth um, into a live CRM environment to show you a couple examples that I've set up uh, that highlights what you can do with, with the different tools we're reviewing today. And then also digging into to how that was set up. So I want to make sure you have a, a little bit of a feel for how you could tackle this yourself um, and hopefully give you some confidence to, to actually go and, and, and try to create some automation automation within your organization and you know try to help your sales manager shave a couple minutes off of you know, creating his reports or uh, just in managing his team and, and obviously in other areas of the system as well. Uh, and then I want to share some resources. So there's a lot of really good resources out there. Some of you are probably familiar with them, but I want to highlight those um, and just make sure that, that you have those tools and you receive this deck so you can go and do some additional learning uh, and start to jump into some of this stuff. Alrighty, so to jump right into it, the tools of the trade, starting with workflow. So workflow is a very powerful tool in CRM. It's been around for a long time, um, but there's a lot of options and a lot of actions and commands that you can take um, that have been growing and, and changing as Microsoft um, releases new versions of CRM. Um, and so, you know, back at the at the start, I believe maybe 2011, um, there was very few options, right? You were you were maybe creating some records or, or updating some fields, um, but you can do much else. And so now you have a lot of flexibility. Um, you can create custom actions even, or if you're using third-party products, um, that can give you additional libraries or, or actions to take within your workflow processes. So, um, you know, when it comes to using DocuSign or some of those other plugins, you can start to create your own workflows around those because they're providing you with those tools um, within the, the workflow creation tool itself. Um, and so as we go through, I'll talk about some specific scenarios where I, I think workflow is really helpful. Um, and a lot of the times it's it's simple things, right? You know, if, if you're getting too complex and getting into, you know, custom plugins and things, um, that's kind of going above and beyond the out-of-the-box workflow. But what you can do with this is just shave minutes off here and there, right? If you're shaving 15 minutes a week off of each salesperson's 
um, time that's going to actually free up a lot of time for them to engage in sales activities. Um, and you can create some really compelling reasons to actually learn how to use workflow within your organization and actually commit time to building these things out. So next up, we have business rules. Um, and so business rules are specific to, to fields or, or really to entities within Dynamics. So you can create business rules um, within your solutions in Dynamics, so in, the, in that customization window for those system administrators out there. Um, and you can also create these just at the field level. So when you're editing a field, you can add a new business rule to dictate um, really what you're watching for there and, and how you want the business rule to affect that particular field. Um, and so as we go into this, we'll see there's a bunch of different options for these. Um, so you have your conditions where you can do your if-else statements and uh, kind of dynamically define when you want that business rule to fire. Um, you also have a bunch of options for actually acting on changing that field. So um, there's uh, quite a few options. You can make recommendations to the end user. You can show or hide the field. Um, you can mark it as required. Uh, and we'll get a little bit deeper into that here in a, in a few minutes. Uh, and then actions. So actions is uh, a very interesting tool that you have at your disposal. So it, it is similar in a lot of ways to workflow, but it's meant to be a bit more general or, or global across your system. Um, so you do have some additional options within actions that we'll dig into. Uh, you can take inputs and, and it can output data as well. Um, but it's also not tied to a specific entity. So for those of you who are already familiar with full workflows, you'll know that you have to select an entity that that workflow is going to act on. Uh, and actions are a little bit different in that it can be global and it can act across the organization in all the, the entities within your system. Uh, and so we'll dig into some of the reasons why there, um, but definitely a powerful tool. One of the key differences is that unlike workflow, you aren't going to be firing this off of a change in the system um, or a creation of a record or anything like that, it's actually an on-demand process only. Um, and so you can fire this up in your command bar with a click, or you can fire it from a workflow if you want to wrap it into some of those triggers. Um, but that's kind of one of the differences. And, and again, we'll get into why in just a minute. And then, like I said, stretching things a little bit outside of, of our Dynamics uh, customer engagement, um, modules and looking at some Power BI reporting and how that can save you some time. So um, Power BI is, is really you know connected into Dynamics 365 at a high level. There's some um, pre-built uh, report packages for Dynamics 365 so you really don't even have to do the work. You can just go and set up the package, turn it on, and then you have some really high-level real-time reporting that users can dig into, you can automate the delivery of those. Um, and so especially for those you know, folks that really want that report you know, given to them or, or sent to them, um, you can do that with Power BI and, and you can automate that. So you know, no more going in, pulling the report, and then sending it off to the user. Uh, you can simply have Power BI throw it into their inbox. And, and so that's something that we'll look at. Uh, we'll also dig into some other ways that you can leverage Power BI to report on your CRM data specifically. Alrighty, workflow. So just jumping right into it here. Um, within the system, creating a workflow, I just want to make sure everybody's familiar with, with kind of the initial steps here. Um, so you can create the, the workflow from your settings pane. Um, so you do have to be a system administrator to create workflows. Um, and so when you go into your processes within Dynamics uh, or into your, your solution, if you'd like to, to build the workflow there, um, you can easily just hit New Workflow. And you'll see a few different options here that I want to talk about. Um, so obviously, you can, you can give this process a name. Like I said, when you define this as a workflow, it's going to ask for a specific entity that you want this, uh, that this workflow to run on. And so in this case, I'm going to select Account. Um, but you can select any uh, workflow-enabled uh, entity. So this isn't specific just to a, a subset um, of records within Dynamics. You can really enact workflow on, on any record that you'd like. 
Um, and then we also have that checkbox there to run this workflow in the background. Um, and so that is recommended by Microsoft, and that is also going to get my personal recommendation. Um, because what that does is it, it basically tells CRM, you know, don't worry about this too much. Run, run the workflow when you have, when you have the resources to do so. Um, and so rather than making this a high priority action for the system, it just sits in the background in, until you know, CRM has the available resources to, um, to actually run that workflow. Uh, so just from a, a performance standpoint, unless this is something that really needs to happen, you know, ASAP, uh, I would definitely recommend leaving that box checked. Uh, and then you also see here we have the option of creating a blank process or creating a new process from a template. Um, and so we'll see when we get into the, the next stage of our workflow creation uh, how you can save a template. So if you're maybe creating an email uh, to follow up with a customer or um, you're you know, updating an account record from somewhere in the system, you can save that as a template so that you can leverage it in the future. Um, so if it's something that you that you might want to spin back up and, and modify, um, kind of like the the using a save as as your for your dashboards, right? You can hit save as, and then you can modify from a starting point rather than starting over. So especially if you're getting into some complex workflows um, that you think you might kind of play with over time or, or modify to fit some new process. Um, definitely recommend saving that as a template so you can use it again and save some time. So here within our workflow creation window, um, you can see my new workflow uh, flowed through here. Um, I'm also going to activate this as a process. This is where you can select uh, creating this as a template. Uh, and then you'll see I also have my entity selected that's now locked. Um, and then my, my workflow selection is locked as well. I'd also like to highlight you can create this as a child or an on-demand process. Um, and so an on-demand process is going to be a workflow that you actually go up into your command ribbon at the top of your record and you'll go into your workflows and you'll fire it from there. And so that's going to be the only way that this workflow can be fired. Um, and so it's going to take a user click and it's going to be a very intentional action. Um, setting this as a child process uh, means that it's not going to have any, any triggers here. So this start when section will get grayed out and this workflow can only be called from another workflow. Um, and so that, that's really common when you have a single workflow that's updating many different records. Um, and so rather than you know, creating many workflows to manage that, you just create one workflow to manage the process of updating all those records and then you're plugging in these children uh, as you build out that workflow. And then here on the right hand side we have the scope of this workflow. So this is very important um, and so this is what defines who can use the workflow. So if I want this to be an admin action, uh, we'll talk about some use cases for, for workflows and one is, is to bulk update records. It can be useful if you want to include some logic in that. And so there, there are scenarios where you would just want to keep this to yourself essentially and, and keep this scoped within your user account. Um, but you can also set this to your business unit um, and more, more common just setting this as a global workflow. So anybody who's using the system is, is going to be able to fire this workflow based on the triggers that you set. And then obviously you have your triggers here within your workflow. So when the record is created, this workflow can fire. Uh, when your main status changes, so that would be you know, active, inactive for a lot of records, or um, open and closed in one, uh, lost for your opportunities. Um, when the record is reassigned, so in, in the scenario for your customer service, um, a lot of those records are changing hands based on who's available to, to take on a ticket. Um, and so we can take action on those reassignments. Um, and then when a field changes is a very common one. So you can create little triggers to update fields or as we'll see later, um, to create documents or to automate different processes within your organization. And then also when a record is deleted. 
Um, so there are cases for, for when you want to allow your users to actually delete records. Um, and a lot of times in those cases, you want to know about it. Um, so in this case, you can at least capture some of the key information within that record and then you know, send it maybe to an inbox um, where you can archive some of those details, um, even for your deleted records. So those are, those are all the triggers that you have there. Um, again, you can fire the workflow um, from the on-demand process as a child of another workflow or from the, the record level um, where changes are happening within that record. Um, and then you have your workflow job retention. And so this is really important. Um, it's really great to, to just set this to delete all these jobs because a lot of us who are in CRM online are, are always wary of you know, how close are we getting to our storage and, and when am I going to have to buy another gigabyte of storage. Um, and so in those cases, it's really nice just to delete all these workflow jobs when they're complete. When I'm debugging my workflows, when I'm creating a workflow, I don't want to check this because I want to understand exactly what happened within that workflow, why did it work, why didn't it work, and I want to be able to review that. Um, so oftentimes I will, I will uncheck this until my final draft or until I um, put this workflow into production, um, and then I will, I will check this to save the disk space. You also have your process sessions here on the left. And so that's where you can go in and see, okay, when is this workflow being called recently? Um, and when has it failed? When has it succeeded? Uh, et cetera. And then we'll get into some of the workflow builds. So I'm, I'm not going to focus on that too much right now. Um, and so you'll see just, just in terms of the options that you have available um, for actions that you can take. Um, oftentimes, checking a condition is going to be your first step, confirming that you know the, the data is in place to successfully run this workflow. And then you have all sorts of creation, update, creating emails, performing actions. Um, as we scroll down here, this is what I was talking about with those third-party um, apps that you may use and some of those libraries that, that you're going to have available to do even more um, with your workflow. And so this is just giving you additional tools to run via workflow. So you'll see since we're a, a project organization in CRM, we have invoices so we can bulk uh, in, in batch create and email invoices here. Um, we have approval um, workflows or, or actions pre-built out for us that we can wrap into our workflows. Uh, so we have a lot of flexibility there. Um, and there's a lot of cool tools in there. There's also, um, you know, as a lot of you may know as administrators, there's a great community of, of users within our, our CRM world, um, especially here in the Seattle area. Um, and so there's a lot of free tools out there that you can install as solution packages um, into your organization to expand what you can do with workflow. Um, and so there's definitely a lot of opportunity there as well. So just to sum up some of our highlights here with workflow, um, we saw a little bit of just how to create it at a high level. Um, you know, what are the, the different options and when would you use those? Uh, and then now I just kind of want to cover some, some scenarios that I think uh, Workflow can do a good job for. So, um, you know, one, one scenario that I like to use Workflow for is to populate contact and account information on my leads. Um, so I hate when I go into a new lead, um, my colleague Nicole is sending me leads all the time, and sometimes not all the data is populated, right? Um, and so I always like to create a workflow uh, for my organization that whenever I plug in an existing contact or an account, if this is an existing customer, it's going to populate all those things for me. So any information that we have on either the contact or the account form, we can use workflow to go in and then populate uh, the lead form. And so we can make decisions about, you know, when do we want to overwrite, when do we want to, you know, only populate a, a, an empty field, but just some things to make it easier on your users and to make them see CRM as, as more of a tool rather than a place where they have to, to punch in a bunch of information and numbers. Uh, another great use of workflow is sending onboarding documents out. We, you know, a lot of organizations talk about Im improving their onboarding process, whether it's with a new hire or an, an incoming customer. Um, and so with workflow, you can, you know, wrap up all of your, your documents that you want to send out, all of the individuals that you want to tie into communications for that onboarding process. And you can just set that up as a simple email template. You can have all those attachments already 
associated with that template and then based on maybe an action with an opportunity or the creation of a new employee user within CRM you can fire those things off um, so just you know making sure some of those steps actually happen I know is a big deal for a lot of organizations uh, and just having some consistency around that um, another thing that we can do with one of our newer features in CRM um, is create word templates and generate those from our workflow um, so some of you may have played a little bit with with word templates um, already uh, but you can essentially dynamically create a word document based off of information in your CRM system um, and so one thing that I like to throw out there as an example is a lot of us are asking our, our customers to sign master services agreements or professional services agreements or, or NDAs, what have you. And we can just automate the creation of that for our sales users. So once they hit a certain spot in our uh, sales stage, we can have those things fire off to the customer or have them created so that the sales users just needs to attach it to an email, write a personalized message, and, and it's out the door. Uh, so that's, you know, as I mentioned, just saving them minutes here and minutes there can really add up and, and really help them see the value of the system. Um, for those of you who are using project service um, or field service, a lot of records are being assigned, a lot of tasks and, and work orders are being assigned to users, uh, and so we can leverage workflow to let them know about it. Uh, so we can send an email, we can give them a, a notification in CRM via a task or um, or or even using our cards for those of you who've used a relationship assistant. Uh, but with things like Flow and other tools that are getting wrapped into our world here with Dynamics, we can even do push notifications now. Um, and so there's a lot of ways that, that you can use your workflow for those things uh, to help out your users. Like I said, bulk updating records. Um, especially as an administrator, if there's a lot of logic that you're trying to process to define whether or not you want to update a record, you can create that as a workflow. So rather than you know creating a um, some sort of plugin or customization that you're going to run to parse all that data and to update it, you can create a simple workflow. Yeah, you might have to do it in batches since you're limited in the number of records you can process at once, um, but that's kind of an easy way to do it yourself without too much technical knowledge. Um, all right, and so that's you know some scenarios that we uh, that we can tackle with workflow, and a little bit later on we're going to be jumping into uh, to a scenario that I set up around um, actually creating a uh, a word template with workflow, and we'll we'll take a look at that in our live demo. Business rules. Um, so business rules are, are a really useful tool. Uh, again, you know a lot of the feedback that we get from our customers is we want to simplify things, right? And so, great, we want to simplify things. And then we go in and, and talk to them about their process, but they do, you know, sell 12 different lines of products um, across, you know, four different sales channels. And so there's a lot of data that we need to collect. Um, and so sometimes, you know, the account forms or the opportunity forms can get pretty messy because you have all these outlying uh, situations that you need to account for. And so that's where business rules can come into play. Um, and so as we look at some of the types of the business rules that we can use, one of them that's on here is show and hide fields. So in the scenario that I just described, you have a lot of data that you need to collect. You have a lot of fields, but you know, 80% of the time they don't need to be filled out. Um, and so you can hide these fields and based on the type of the opportunity or the type of the account, um, you can actually prompt the system via the business rule to show that field and even require it as you can see here. Um, and so that's just a way of keeping your forms simple, keeping your end users happy um, by keeping the forms really um, high importance, right? Having every field that's on there be very important to them and provide value to them. And so again, everything is really about adoption, right? And ease of use. Um, and so business rules really, um, really play into that uh, by enabling you to, um, to really help the user based on the process that they're currently running through. So just to hit each one of these uh, business rule types, recommendations um, enable you to actually put a recommendation icon on the screen next to whatever field you define and actually fill out the field for the user. So the recommendation could say, you know, hey, do you want me to populate this field with um, 
with a, a contact that we know of at this account. And you can hit the yes and it'll populate for you or you can hit the no and you can punch it in yourself. Um, so it's kind of a way for fields that aren't required that you can try to encourage users to fill those out and actually make it easy on them by one, giving them more information on what you're looking for there and two, making an assumption of what they're gonna wanna fill out there and, and doing that for them. Um, error messages, so um, you can actually use pop-up messages within your organization um, to make sure the user is aware of, of something that they're doing. So, um, you know, one example that I think of is in the opportunity record or in the project record, you often have descriptions of what you're trying to accomplish. So what's the solution here? Whether you're selling a product or the solution of, let's say, a, a professional services project. And so those are things that kind of develop over time. So uh, we aren't always requiring those fields. And even when we are, we're looking for some thoughtful information, right? Um, and so you could pop an error message based on too short of a response, right? And you could say, hey, I was looking for more of a, a thorough response here. We're really trying to understand what this solution is. And the importance of this is that when we you know, review this project in a year, we really want to understand what that solution that we were going for was. Uh, and so you can do that as a pop-up for that user. Um, and no, they do not have to hit that character limit. Um, but it's another way just to remind your users to, to do a good job of, of completing those fields and filling out the data. Uh, again, showing and hiding fields, uh, switching between optional and required. And so we'll see that in our live demo today. Setting the value of a field. Uh, so as a user goes through and, uh, and is filling out a form, we can have other fields being populated based on uh, the data that they're providing. Uh, and the same with the default. So if you want a field to always have a default, you can, you can set that based on other things that are filled out in the system as well. Um, and so, yes, you can do default values from, um, from your field creation itself, but here you can actually have that be set dynamically. Uh, and then locking and unlocking fields. So in a lot of cases, you have fields that once they're filled out, you don't want people to go in and mess with them and change them. Um, and so from maybe a sales manager's perspective, one of those things is our estimated close date. What value does that provide us if we're pushing that back a week every single Monday? Um, and so you can actually lock that field once it has a value in it, and then the user is really going to be kind of held honest with their estimate for closing that deal, and you can get some really good reports out of our actual close date versus our, our initial estimated close date. Um, and so when it comes to the creation of business rules, as I said earlier, you have two options here. Um, and so on the right-hand side, actually, here we have our, our solution. So whether this is your customization window or if you're in your specific solution, you could go in and for any given entity, you can create a new business role. Um, you can also do this from your form editor. So if you're in the form editor, you want to create a new rule, you can simply click into a field, um, and then there's that business rules tab, as you can see here, and you can create a new rule there. Uh, and we'll jump into a little bit of the actual UI for creating that rule and, and implementing the logic and the, um, the actions that you want to take there. Um, but this is the actual um, kind of initiation point of creating that, uh, that business rule. All right, so again, some of the scenarios that I want to highlight for business rules, just to wrap things up here. Hiding fields that aren't relevant. So I, I think I've already beat that dead horse, um, but it's very, very important for a lot of end users that things are easy and simple and that they know what fields they need to fill out. Um, and so there's a lot of value in, in hiding some fields that aren't um, gonna be important to that particular user. Um, creating recommendations. So there's a lot of times where, you know, as an administrator, you can say, well, I assume that they're gonna want to, to fill out this value here and you can use a recommendation to, to kind of push that assumption on the end user. There's also a lot of times where you start to do some reporting and you're seeing, well, what I'm getting out of this field isn't what, what I'm asking for really. Um, and so you can give them more information through a recommendation to help the end user understand what that field is and what it's for so that they can do a better job of, of providing the data points that you need as an organization. Um, 
you can also dynamically set fields. So um, if we want to um, if we want to fill out a estimated close date based on today's date and the type of sales opportunity, uh, we could do that with with a business rule um, by dynamically setting that date based on um, what that opportunity type is and however many weeks from today's date we want to set that out. Um, so especially if you have some kind of wishy-washy data around your estimated close dates, um, that can be valuable just to get some consistency there um, and to help start to build out those reports and to understand uh, maybe where the process is slowing things down or, or maybe where the end user is, is struggling within that particular sales cycle. Actions. So um, again, like I said, actions are, are kind of a, a hard one to wrap your head around. So, or, or at least for me. So when I first started digging into actions, I was trying to understand, well, why, why would I ever want to use an action when I have a workflow at my disposal, which just seems easier. Um, and so, you know, from my perspective, I'm not all that technical. Uh, I'm not writing a lot of plugins or anything like that. And I know there's some value to actions there, um, which we'll talk about. But that was just something that I struggled with. And so it took a lot of research and, um, and just a lot of toying with actions to actually kind of make it click. And, and so hopefully today I, I can kind of help you get partway there at least in, in understanding why you'd want to use an action instead of a workflow. So what are they? They're quite similar. As you can see here, we're actually going to be creating them through the same um, interface that we're creating our workflows. It even has the same UI for building out those steps. So as we saw within our workflow creation window, we have the, uh, the conditions and the various steps and, and other actions actually that we can call um, from within that. And we're going to be using that to build our actions as well. But as you can see here, one of the biggest things is that it, this is not tied to an entity. So I have the option to select a, a non-specific option here. So this is just a global action. I can call it from anywhere, and I can you know, enact it on any, um, on any entity within my system. So that doesn't mean it's going to work, because it needs the right input, depending on what you're, you're doing with it. Um, but you can actually design these to save you a lot of time as really as requirements change. Um, and so I, I think a lot of us have probably been there where you have you know, even hundreds of workflows and then process changes. And then you have to go back and figure out, okay, what are all the workflows that touch that process? What are they doing? Where are they being called from? What are the different, um, you know, what are the different commands that I'm prompting? Am I creating records? Am I creating emails? And so that's one of the huge values of these global actions is that you can create an action that let's say it creates an email it it selects a contact to send that email to it dynamically populates the message and then it, it sends that email if I do that in a workflow and I call it from seven different records within my system well if I want to change the messaging in that email I have to go to all seven workflows and I have to go in and individually change all of those email messages. If I'm using actions, all of that's essentially centralized to this global action. So I just have to go into the action and change the message there, and I'm done. Um, and so, you know, there's there's a lot of cases where, where actions can be valuable, but that's just one area where you're kind of doing the same thing over and over in many different workflows. Um, and so you can use an action to to help centralize that. Um, that process so that you don't have to um, to do the same act or the, the same uh, changes seven different times. Uh, and then when it comes to plugins and, and other customizations um, and even calling actions from your workflows, they can take inputs and outputs. Um, and so you can actually take in parameters and you can spit out um, different parameters. So um, that can be very valuable within within a plugin, but also within a workflow. Um, you can pull in some inputs, use them within that action, and then in the next step within your workflow, you're going to have the outputs of that action available to you for your next steps. Um, and so that's another good use of actions, and, um, and, and we can talk a little bit more that, about that later on. 
And so another core difference here with our actions is that it's on demand only. Um, and so for those of you that are familiar with the uh, <clears throat> the ribbon workbench in, in your command bar there within CRM, you can assign these actions a uh, slot up in that command bar. So you can do these as a, a clickable action for your user. So whether that's you know maybe closing out a record or firing a process, that might be another reason why you would want to use that action. Um, but then again, it can also be called by workflows. Um, and so those are kind of the, the two ways, or, or I guess the third would be, like I said, within plugins. Uh, so those are the ways that you're going to be um, leveraging your actions and, and how you're going to call those. Um, so one of the scenarios that I wanted to talk about here was with one of our newer uh, pieces of functionality within Dynamics 365, which is our portals. Um, and so for those of you that have used portals, you'll know you can send invites out to your contacts and then they can sign up and, and they can get access to your or some of your CRM data through that uh, external facing portal. Um, and so out of the box, it's all set up to just fire off of that contact, right? So just send that contact an email and, and they'll get that information. But what if I want a lead or an opportunity um, or an account or some other custom record within the system to get an invite to my portal? What if, what if I don't want to just go through contacts? Um, and so you could actually leverage the, the action to send that portal request um, and call that from anywhere in the system that is actually related to a contact record. Um, and so that would be a way that you could leverage actions um, to do that. So rather than having to go and send invites to, to maybe a subgrid of, of contacts tied to an account, you could really streamline that and even wrap it into your workflows so that anytime maybe you had a customer account, we can send an invite to each and every one of those contacts. Again, only needing to update the contents of that action in one place, um, deploying it across many entities, which is something that we haven't been able to do in the past um, in CRM. Um, and, and another really nice thing that you can do with these actions um, tied to that portal is as those users are creating cases or submitting forms into your system, you can actually take that input, work with that data within that action, right, with some of the logic that you can uh, implement there, and then you can, can take action on that and make some commands and customize how that data comes into the system. Uh, and so that's another way that you can kind of use that action as almost like a, a middleware or a, a, an extra step um, to transform that incoming data. All right, and then our last section, just to, to chat about at a high level, is Power BI. Um, so just automating some of the reporting steps, right? Nobody wants to have to pull a report for someone else and save it and send it and change all the parameters and um, you know update SQL whenever they need to change the report. Um, and so Power BI is a really useful way to, to really think about your reporting. So it's all going to be real time. Um, you have a lot of options for sharing the reports with your end users. And I would, I would take a guess that a lot of you out there um, probably already have Power BI licenses. It's included in a lot of the enterprise licensing from Microsoft Office 365. Um, and so a lot of you probably have the tool, um, and so why not leverage it? Um, so again, you're going to have real-time reports in Power BI. You can update this data as frequently as you'd like. Um, it's all now going to be centralized, so you don't have to report on CRM and CRM and, and ERP and ERP, and you know maybe you're using Trello or, or wherever else. It doesn't all have to be separate anymore. You can connect all those sources with Power BI. You can store all those data sets in one place, um, and you can report on everything and even join those data sets um, to actually understand the full picture rather than just what's in this system and what's in that system. There's more than 200 data connectors, um, and so a lot of you out there might be using third-party apps, like I just mentioned Trello. I know we have some customers using Trello. Um, we have people using third-party uh, time entry, and then there's you know a million different um, different applications out there 
that people use to, to fill different gaps and, and to tackle different pieces within their business processes. So Power BI connects to many of those. Um, and where it doesn't have a specific connector for a product, it has you know generic OData connectors and, um, and, and all that sort of stuff. So you can really connect to, to whatever you need. And so when it comes to the automate part, and, and I'm gonna say that a little bit loosely, and obviously it's running these reports on its own, and when we talk about having to, to take those steps to deliver a report, you can automatically have that show up in a user's inbox. So you can set daily or weekly report delivery. And so it's gonna just send them a link um, and they can just navigate to it and there you go, their report will pop up. They can look at the report to their hard extent and now since they're in Power BI, they can actually drill into the report so they can start to get a little bit more out of the reports that you're creating for them um, and actually dig into the details um, and modify the views based on different records that they're clicking on as they go through. Um, you can do some custom alerts and report delivery with flow. So if daily and weekly reports doesn't, uh, doesn't get you too excited about Power BI, we can use flow to do some cool stuff. So um, flow can really fully give you control over when these reports are gonna be delivered. Um, I know for me, for my personal reports, when they get updated, uh, I don't have them update all the time. And when they do update, it doesn't always have updates that I care about all that much. So I set some alerts in Power BI, and if my KPIs that I care about move out of their thresholds, I get a push notification on my phone. Um, and so that's something that for me, really makes me want to use Power BI because I don't have to worry about it all the time. If things are getting really good or really bad and I want to know about them, it's going to pop up on my phone, which is always pretty much right in front of my face or, or I'll even get it on my watch here. Um, and so there's a lot you can do combining that with Flow. And just having a highly accessible reporting tool. Um, it's going to be available on your phone or just on a browser, anywhere you are, any browser, you can get to these reports. So you don't have to be in CRM, you don't have to be at a web, you know, at a desktop machine. You can really get to this stuff from here. Uh, and so here's just a nice screenshot of one of those uh, I mentioned, one of the packages that you can install um, and get some really cool reports here. So you can see this is specific for Dynamics 365 for sales. So we have a lot of useful KPIs and then some metrics around where our sales activities are occurring um, and some other reports here. So even if you don't love this report, but you like some pieces, you can download the package and you can drag and drop and delete and use this as a starting point. Um, and also just a way to learn how to set these things up. You can dig in to actually how that report was built um, and kind of reverse engineer it if you want to build something similar. Here's our, uh, our mobile interface. This is just something that I, uh, I snipped off of the, the web browser mobile view, uh, but it actually looks a bit nicer, to be honest, on, on your phone. Um, and so you just get the Power BI app and you can access all your reports and it really just stacks them vertically so you can scroll up and down to get to everything there. All right, so jumping into our workflow demo, the scenario I wanted to tackle here um, is leveraging our, our word templates and dynamics and creating those with a workflow. So the, the example that I had mentioned was a lot of us have some standard documents that have to get signed before we can work with our customers. And it, it sucks when that slows our sales process down, when that slows down our ability uh, to, to bring on a new customer. And so really just using the workflow to wrap this into your sales process, make sure it gets done early enough um, so that you can get everything signed and ready to go even before the, the customer is ready to purchase so that you you have all the, the building blocks in place to actually create an order or to provide some services. Switching into my Chrome window here. Um, so here I am and I want to start just by running through this scenario. Uh, I'm on my home page for Dynamics 365 um, and I'm in my sales module. So what I'm going to do here is just navigate to the opportunity that I'm working on. So here we're selling some products to uh, Fourth Coffee House. 
um, and we're providing some services around around selling this. So as a part of that, I need to get them to, to sign an MSA. So you can see here I'm partway through my sales cycle. I still have a little ways to go. But before I move into flushing out their proposal and getting it out the door, the final draft here, I want to make sure that I at least send them the MSA. And so just with a simple click, I can mark this to send the MSA. My record's going to save. And then what this is going to do is, is actually create that, that Word document. Um, and so if I wanted to, I could have the system create the Word document, even translate that to a PDF and send it off to the customer. Um, so if you want this to really be seamless and, and you don't see any need for the sales user to, um, to interact with that, um, you, could do it, you could do it that way. Um, in this particular case, I just had it create that document, and so as I refresh here, it's going to show up within my notes pane. So now you can see I have my master services agreement. I can pull that document down. This will just download through Chrome, and it'll pull that agreement. So you can see here I had one in the background, which I'll switch to in a second. Uh, but here we have fourth coffee house and then as I go to the bottom all this is just standard text and, and that's often the case with some of these documents that you want to automate um, and then I can populate the individuals who need to end up signing this as well if we look at our actual um, template here you can see on the right hand side we have our mapping pane so this is where we're digging into our opportunity we're dynamically selecting fields to insert onto the to the Word doc here. And then you can see you just do a simple snippet to insert that piece of information. And then when we pull it from CRM, it shows up, um, it shows up right there in our notes pane. So that's just a quick and, and easy example of how you might save a user a couple minutes um, working with those different agreements. Um, and so at this point, the user can simply go into their activities. They can create that email and they can add that attachment. Um, it'll just be in your default uh, downloads window. You can uh, pop it into your email, you can write a personalized message, and then you can send it along. So that's just a simple uh, a use case for, uh, for workflows. If we want to dig into the actual creation of that workflow, we can jump into our, our window here. Um, so this is just our workflow creation window, as we saw earlier. Um, I'll deactivate this so we can dig into a little bit of how this was created. So as we saw earlier, um, I've created a, um, a scope of organization for this particular process. So anybody within the organization uh, will have the ability to fire this workflow. Um, again, I unchecked my job retention just to make sure that that document was created successfully. At this point, I guess I'm comfortable checking that. Um, as I said, your other options are user, business user, um, the parent-child business unit. So if you are a parent, um, this will be available to all the children, um, business units as well. And then this is only going to fire on that field change. And so I've just selected the send MSA field, but you can actually select multiple fields here as well. So if I go into my process sessions, as I said, this is where you can get a snapshot of how many times this has been used, when it succeeded, and, and when it's failed. So I'm going to go ahead and close out of this. Go back to our presentation here, and now we can jump into a quick look at business rules and, and how to build that out. So I'm going to go over to our account form in CRM. I'll go back to my main window. I can go to my uh, home screen there, or actually I'll just jump directly to a datum, which is the account form I want to take a look at. So here within a datum, um, they are, let's say, a new record that just got added to the system, um, and, and that explains some of our empty fields here. So in this case, a datum is a partner of ours. So I'm going to go ahead and select partner. And so as you can see, I now have a new field available to me. So because I selected partner as the relationship type, my business rule for this partner type field uh, told CRM, okay, let's make this field visible. It also defined this as now a required field. 
uh, because even if that field was hidden, um, if it was still required in the background, I would not be able to save this record. And so when I now can select my partner type here, I have a few different options. I'm going to select channel sales. So you'll see that again, now it gives me another field that's available for me to populate. So rather than having all three of these fields sitting here and empty um, for my customer accounts, I can hide these things and just show them when I create a new partner. And you'll notice for my partner account manager field that I want to fill out here, I have a recommendation icon. So if I click this, I'm going to get some more information. So it says, is this our PAM? Is this the primary contact for this account? Um, and I can hit yes if the primary matches who our partner account manager is, or I can dismiss it if I want to fill this out myself. So as you can see up in our primary uh, contact window here, it is Vincent Laurent. Maybe he is the VP of sales or the uh, COO at this particular organization. He's not going to be our partner account manager. So I can hit dismiss and fill it out myself. If it is Vincent, I can hit apply and it's automatically going to populate that based on the primary contact within this particular organization. So just a little bit behind how this was built. I actually created this using two separate uh, business rules. So if I wanted to, I could string this together all in one, um, but I prefer to keep them separate and simple. So if something breaks, I don't have this big long string of, um, of conditions and actions that I have to, to fight through. Um, and so you can see this starts with my condition. If relationship type equals partner, I'm setting my visibility. You can see on the right hand side I have my properties here, setting my visibility and setting business required. I'm also undoing those things if my relationship type is no longer partner because I do not want a hidden um, required field. There's nothing that will make an end user more angry than not being able to save a record because something that they can't see is telling them to fill it out. Um, so that's a big piece of this as well. Um, and then also clearing that information. So if you're doing any reporting on that partner type field, you want to make sure you clear that if somebody maybe mistakenly adds them as a partner and then changes it. So that's pretty simple, right? It's, it's just creating some show actions, some uh, hide actions. And you'll see here within our components, here's the, all the other components that we have available to us as we saw earlier on. Another big piece of this is where this action, or, or sorry, where this business rule is going to take place. So here I have the scope set to all forms. Much like our scope with our workflow, you have other options. So I'll deactivate this so we can see our options quickly. But you can set this specific to um, a single form. So maybe if there's an admin form where you want some certain rules and things, or maybe you have a partner account form and you, and you want to enact some rules there. Um, you have some, some flexibility. So we have a couple of portal forms and you can see you can set the specific to those. The second half of our workflow is what's actually pulling in that recommendation. So if our um, partner type is channel sales, we're going to be setting the visibility on this record. I decided I did not want to make that required. Maybe we haven't learned who that individual is yet. And then here's our recommendation. So here's where we can put in some additional information to provide to our user. And then here's the action. When they hit that checkbox, what's going to happen? And so in this case, I'm taking my partner account manager field and I'm populating it with my primary contact contents. And so really it's as simple as dragging and dropping these conditions and actions into the UI to be able to create these business rules on your own. So you can create these very rapidly. Um, so it, it does seem daunting if there's a lot of fields you want to hide, but it is quite easy to do um, and you can knock it out pretty quickly. So definitely a, a powerful tool there. All right, and then the last piece of our demo here today is Power BI. So I've been talking a lot about how cool Power BI is. I'm, I'm sure you've heard it from other folks at Encore as well. Um, and so just want to take a look at some of the ways you can automate some of the reporting steps for you. So if I'm starting in my mailbox here, we'll say I have this new message. So this Power BI dashboard was shared with me. This could be done manually. This could be done, as I said, with the weekly or daily um, daily subscription, as it's called, that you're making to that particular report. 
So now I can click into that, and as easy as that, I'm looking at my, my real-time data. Um, so here I have all those KPIs that we saw in the screenshot. I can interact with the data like, oh, whoa, I didn't know we operated in South Africa. You know, what is this data? And so now it's going to pull me into the specific report where I can then interact with the data. And when I click on that data point, you saw it updated all the records within the system. And then I can click off of that, and it uh, resumes all the other data on this sheet. Um, you'll see here. I have a lot of KPIs. I have the ability to create thresholds around this and other um, actions. If I go into, let's go into the sales pipeline here. So we have some one revenue, we have a win rate, um, we have open revenue. What if I want to know when things aren't going well? I want to set an alert. Like I said, I can set an alert and I can uh, I can get an update from my um, from my phone or as a push notification, what have you. Um, so let me jump back to my dashboard quickly. And so some of the KPIs that are important to me are how much revenue is actually open and in the pipeline. So I can go here and I can actually create an alert. And so if I want to add a rule here, I can just say if this drops below, let's say 12 million, oh, it doesn't like my commas there, See if I can get the zeros right on the first try. If I go below 12 million, I can get an alert here. And maybe I only want to know once every 24 hours. You know, I don't. If something's not going well, I don't want to hear about it every hour. Um, and so I'm going to limit that to the the 24 hours. And so that'll give me a notification here in Power BI. I can also have it send me an email. So as easy as that, I now have a new uh, reminder there. I can also do it with revenue if I want to set more of a, a positive alert. You know, hey, we've now closed three million in revenue. I want to know about it, and I can get that push notification to my phone, and I can immediately congratulate the team on on hitting that milestone for the quarter. Um, and so, those are just some simple ways that you can leverage those reminders. If you're ever setting those thresholds, like I said, there's already some uh, flow templates created that are going to take that and send you a push notification. So if that's something that you're interested in or any other use of Flow, there's a lot of pre-created templates that are tied to both Power BI and Dynamics 365. So just to wrap things up here, I really want to encourage everyone who's interested in, in workflow to actually jump in and, and do some of it yourself. Um, it's not always easy to you know, scope a big project and, and get that approved. So why not tackle some of it yourself if, if you think it's interesting and, and you think you can you think you can do it. So um, where to start? Customer Source has a lot of really good resources to to learn some of the basics. So for those of you who do not have access to Customer Source, make sure to let us know. Uh, we can certainly help get you access. So there's a lot of really good videos. What I like about it is it's not an hour long video. It's broken down into very specific um, learning actions or, or learning goals. So you can just go sit down in 10 minutes, five minutes at a time, learn something new. Um, as I said before, Dynamics 365 has a really good community. And there's a forum and all sorts of resources on community.dynamics.com. Um, and so that's also really useful if you're an admin to actually post questions. You'll get a lot of feedback from partners, from other customers. And so anytime you're getting stuck on things, you can usually get some help there. Uh, join your local CRM user group. I don't know if everybody here is from Seattle, but we have a really good group that usually meets on the east side about once a quarter. Um, and just a way to, to learn from other people, learn what other organizations are doing with CRM, um, and get get lunch out of the deal. So it's it's a really good group and it's a lot of fun. All right. Well, I really appreciate everybody taking your time this morning. Uh, and I hope you, you were able to take something away from this presentation uh, and hope to hear from everybody soon.